Our gospel lesson this morning can be found on page 849 in the Pew Bibles. If you follow along there. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 13th chapter. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. And Jesus said to them, You go and tell that fox for me, Listen, I am casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow, and on the third day I will finish my work. Yet today, tomorrow, and the next day, I must be on my way, because it is inconceivable for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you. And I tell you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you. Please be seated. I don't know about you, but I'm getting a little tired. <clears throat> of getting called out during the political campaign. It seems that somehow living in Washington has made us all some sort of cabal, and we are the source and motivation for all evil in the world or something, because everything is how Washington doesn't get it. Washington sucks the money away from hardworking Americans and wants to take away everybody's freedom and spends like it's nobody's check in the checkbook. And basically anything that's wrong with the world, it's Washington's fault. Not about you, but I think most of you I know, if not all of you, I don't think you're doing that. You may not, or you probably don't, have a whole lot of say-so in those kind of decisions. In fact, you're suffering under some of the same complaints other people are. I know I am. I have no say-so in who selects the next Supreme Court justice or the next president or any of that stuff, any more than any other person in this country does. But somehow Washington has become the enemy. 3.5 million people are now the enemy of the entire United States. It's kind of inconceivable, isn't it? I mean, you think about it. Can we really do that much here? Now, granted, there is a beltway mentality. There definitely is that. When, uh, when we first moved here in 1990, I was stationed at the Pentagon, and we, we lived in Springfield, and we read the local paper, watched the local news, Converse with our friends about local things. Four years later, we moved to Chicago for seminary, and after about six months, I said, wow, there's like only one page in the paper here about anything to do with the government or politics. So there is a certain beltway mentality. But I don't think we're all evil. I don't think we're all failures. I don't think we're all enemies of the state. But that bogeyman is still out there, that image, that, that idea that some of the elites, some of the ones who are in charge, we're against what they're doing. And so let's just come up with an easy title, an easy mnemonic aid, an easy way to image who we're against. Kind of what Jesus was doing in Jerusalem. 
You know, in some ways, Jesus felt that he'd been rejected by Jerusalem. Now, not everybody in Jerusalem. I mean, come on, there had to be some people. I mean, he walked into Jerusalem in a few weeks with crowds cheering his arrival. Hosanna to the son of David. And we know that after the Pentecost event, 3,000 were added to his followers that first day. But Jerusalem is that idea of standing in for the elites of the faith, the Jewish authorities, the power people. They're the ones that had turned their back on Jesus, who had rejected his message, saw him as a threat, were plotting to kill him or at least bring him down some way. These are the ones that he's really kind of addressing here. And yet, I don't hear him calling for any of them to be run out of town. He's not calling them leeches. He's not denigrating them as individuals. He's not calling for vengeance upon them or their destruction. No, Jesus, Jesus shows pity remorse, concern that he's tried to love them and they haven't responded, sorrow that they're turning their back on him, a sense that somehow he's lost them and it pains him to say that. Jesus can only do this because of his relationship with God, with the Father. I mean, he's, he's in the midst of the shadow of Herod's fortress, in, in the heartland of Herod Antipas's territory up around Capernaum. He is there as a muckraker. One would be seen as a troublemaker. His cousin or relative or friend John the Baptist has been beheaded by Herod because he called out Herod on something he had done against the rule, against the law. And now the word was that Herod was coming after him, or at least that's what some of the Pharisees wanted Jesus to think. Because some of the Pharisees didn't like Jesus either. What he was teaching undermined everything they stood for. What he was doing, mingling with the lesser classes, with the less worthy, with the untouchables, if you will, threw a wrench in the works that they had prospered under and benefited from. Healing the sick, casting out demons, eating with tax collectors and other sinners, was not the way to become close to God. For a prophet to bring a message from God that says you need to be the last and serve others first. Well, it just wasn't well received. It was scorned. It was rejected. Now, I'm not the Pope, although sometimes I think I would be, like to be, but I'm not the Pope. But I got to agree with them this time. I think anybody that wants to build walls instead of building bridges is probably not really a Christian. And what authority do I have to say that? No more than anybody else. But that's what I believe Christianity is about. I believe that's what my relationship with God teaches me. The example of, my, of Jesus' relationship with the Father is that we have total trust. In his providence, his amazing grace, his acceptance and love of us. Even, even in the shadow of death and persecution, 
That's what gives Jesus the strength to move on through this. That's what gave the followers of Jesus after his resurrection the strength to move on. That's what motivated the gospelers and the evangelists and the church to go to places unheard of or unthinkable. To share the good news of a God who loves all of creation. And see, it's, it's something that we can cling on to. In fact, we have to cling on to. Because we may find ourselves on the outs sometimes. We may find ourselves in that position where we need to take something that's unpopular as a stance that will cause us to be booed or heckled to have stuff thrown at us, to be run out of town, to be hated and despised. We even have people threaten our lives. Yes, even simple things that we do as Christians could cause that response. One of the other lessons for today is from the book of Philippians. And in that reading for the day, if you will, sets the tone for what we say. Is our hope. Is our reason that we can, even in this nation, in this society, in this culture, cling to. But we have to say something that may not be popular. For many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. I have often told you of them, and now I tell you even with tears. Their end is destruction. Their God is the belly, and their glory is in their shame. Their minds are set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. It is from there that we are expecting a Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, we belong to that kingdom of heaven, to that reign of God that says, you know what, in spite of all the other stuff that seems to be counterintuitive and all those things that seem to be working against us, the power of God still remains. The gospel of love is expanding, is extending, and is reaching out through people like you and me, through the power of God's Spirit to change the world, to counter all those forces that call out for vengeance, for destruction. taking over, for conquering, for killing, for rejecting. The gospel is pushing us, compelling us, and protecting us, and calling for mercy, and for grace, and for compassion, for hope. And we can only do this. I can only do this. If I know someone's got my back. That I'm not relying on the very structures that I'm calling out. I only can do this. I trust that my citizenship, my, my residence, my place is in the kingdom of God. Not constrained to the kingdom of this world. Don't let your God be your belly. 
Don't let your way be to destruction. Don't confine yourself only to earthly things. Trust in the God who loves you, who claims you, who has redeemed you. And now wants to empower you to go and be his disciple. Are you ready? It's a tough job. Amen.